Chapter 13 What are we going to do when we get there? Doug asked Curtis as they neared the house at the end of the street. Curtis wasn't even sure what to do or why he was so determined to take on the monster he'd seen in the street moments ago. Was it to save the family that might live there? Or did he just want to take out his frustration toward Owen and the orb on the creature? They stopped in front of the house, gasping from the run down the hill from Colin's house. The two of them were completely unarmed, which was not good at all. Curtis looked around for something to use. There was a for sale sign in the front yard. He grabbed it and broke it in half, handing a piece to Doug. Are you serious? Doug asked. We need to get Owen. Why? You killed one of these things with your bare hands, remember? The one-story house loomed in front of them, dark and creepy looking. It reminded Curtis of Les's house. In fact, the whole neighborhood seemed oddly quiet, considering it was the middle of the day. Where was everybody? The front door before Doug and Curtis was open, and nothing but darkness beyond it. Doug took the first step forward. Curtis followed. The smell that hit their nostrils was horrible and familiar. It was blood. Curtis flipped the switch, but no light filled the foyer. Doug took a step forward, but Curtis halted him and went first. The living room was on their right, and it reflected the dark blue of the overcast sky outside. The living room had black leather furniture on a cream-colored carpet. A little spot of blood stained the floor. There was something else, too. It looked like... pieces of skin. I'm going to be sick, Doug said quietly. They walked into the living room, looking around with quick snaps of the neck. Curtis's heart was racing, and he could swear he heard Doug's as well. They were both breathing hard, scared to death. As they made their way around the couch, Curtis saw something in the kitchen. It was on the floor. He halted Doug again. A pair of legs stuck out from behind the wall, blood-stained sneakers on its feet. Watch my back, Curtis said, and went into the dark kitchen. What lay before him nearly made him scream. Vanessa put little Sidney down in her crib carefully. She wasn't happy with what was going on in her house. Not one bit. She loved her husband dearly, and though he used to talk about Owen all the time, she wasn't exactly happy to have Colin's childhood friend here now. He seemed nice enough, but already Colin's mood was changing, as if he were gradually deteriorating. How is he going to react when Owen leaves again? She wondered. Vanessa wasn't looking forward to finding out. Colin was capable of extreme acts. He had a crazy personality, and she wouldn't change that for the world. Though if she could change one thing, it would be his annoying urge to fight anyone who looked at him funny. There had been a few occasions where Vanessa had to break up a fight between her husband and some stranger. There were some things that she hoped would never change, though. For one, she loved the way he would squint his eyes to see distant things because he refused to get glasses, or how he was always calling people silly, even though his friends would make fun of him for using that word so often. She forgot all those things when, suddenly, the lights in the house went out. Vanessa froze in the middle of the hallway. Even though it was the middle of the day, the sky was so overcast that it was as good as night outside. She walked to the bay window and looked out. She could barely see anything. Where was Colin? She looked around the house. No one was here except for Owen, who was still sitting at the dining table, his eyes staring blankly ahead, and his hands in his backpack. Something inside the bag was glowing white. Vanessa took a step forward to see what was going on when the doorknob on the front door started to turn. She looked out the peephole to see who was there, 
but could only see a large, dark figure staring back. Nervously, Vanessa locked the door. There was a loud screech from the other side, and whoever was there vanished in an instant. Vanessa jumped away from the door and backed into someone. She screamed and spun around, throwing wild punches. Hey, hey, Colin screamed, grabbing her arms. Vanessa hugged him, gasping from fear. Someone's at the door, she said against his chest. I know, he whispered, pulling her back into the hall. I saw them when I was in the garage. A noise came from the kitchen. It was the door that led to the garage. Oh, crap, Colin said. I didn't lock the door. They leaned against the wall and peered into the kitchen. Vanessa nearly screamed when she saw what was in there. Two large, bald, long-limbed creatures with tar-black skin were walking around on all fours. One of them approached Owen and sniffed his face. Vanessa's heart was racing, and she could feel Collins doing the same. The other creatures sniffed Owen, too. Then they both looked down into the glowing backpack. Colin pulled Vanessa away from the kitchen as quietly as he could. She saw both monsters look up at the same time. Colin continued to drag Vanessa down the hallway with him when two long shadows appeared on the floor, the light coming from whatever was in Owen's backpack. Just then, the Matthewses backed into the first open bedroom they came to. Colin was about to close the door, but he heard a noise just outside the room. It sounded like someone running down the hall. The sound put Vanessa's nerves on edge. Come out, punks, said a young male voice. Hide, Colin whispered to Vanessa. They were in the guest room. The closet was criminally small, but Vanessa ran into it while Colin hid on the other side of the bed. Colin looked under the bed to the bedroom door. His heart was beating so furiously he was afraid the creatures would hear it. He could see them standing just outside the room with their long black feet and bony ankles. What were these things, and why were they here? One of the monsters started walking to the end of the hall, its long toenails clicking on the wood floor. But the other one entered the room. Colin slid slowly under the bed, not knowing what else to do. His fear was making it hard to think. He feared for himself, his wife, his baby. The thought of Sidney alone in her room at the end of the hall almost made him jump out from under the bed, but the black creature was right next to him. He was trapped. He watched the creature walk up to the dresser next to the bed, and then saw, with amazement, its legs begin to lighten in color. Its feet got shorter, too. It was changing somehow. What the hell were these things? Come on out, sugar, said a female voice from the hallway. You ain't in trouble, baby. A pair of elderly wrinkled legs appeared in the hall just outside the door. Colin recognized the voice as belonging to Miss Summers from down the street and he imagined her legs to look like what he was seeing now, though he'd never seen them before. But he knew Miss Summers wasn't here, and he knew he couldn't stay under this bed for long. Either these things would find him and his wife, or they would go after the baby, and he couldn't allow that to happen. Doug didn't see what Curtis had seen, but he figured it was bad. Curtis stood on the curb, holding back tears. His body was convulsing with the effort. Doug stood on the porch, looking around carefully for any sign of the monster. He was tempted to go in the house to see the condition of the body lying on the floor in the kitchen. They had seen quite a few bodies on the way to this town, so this one must have been bad if it affected Curtis the way it had. That thought was what kept Doug right where he was. Curtis stopped convulsing and turned to him, his cheeks wet with tears. We have to stop this, he said to Doug. Stop what? 
all of this. We have to give those things what they want. Curtis pointed out to Silver, who was but a massive dark figure in the distance. What did you see in there? Doug asked, nodding to the house behind him. The kid we saw in the street. The real one. He was all messed up. These monsters. They're not just drinking blood anymore, I don't think. They are mutilating. Curtis suddenly threw up in the street. Doug looked away, afraid he would throw up too. The neighborhood was way too quiet for this time of day. He wondered if anyone else on the street had been attacked. With the wooden stake in his hand, he went to the house next door and peered in through the window. The inside was dark. He rang the doorbell. No one answered. Curtis walked up to him. What are you doing? I'm checking on the neighbors. There's something really wrong here. They both looked around again, stakes raised. Maybe nobody's home, Curtis offered. Let's get back to the house, Doug said. This whole neighborhood is giving me the creeps. Why were the lights off in that house? He pointed to the one with the kid's body. Curtis didn't know, but this whole situation felt like a horror movie. He wondered if the monsters, which were able to take on other people's identities, according to Owen, were doing this on purpose. Were they able to link Halloween with horror movie cliches? Were they cutting the power to their victims' homes for fun? Curtis shuddered at the thought as they trotted up the hill, back to the Matthews house. The plastic skeletons and scarecrows and pumpkins in everyone's yards were adding to the creep factor. As they went, Doug saw an old lady sitting in her rocking chair. Her gray hair was tied back in a ponytail, and she had a black shawl draped over her shoulders. She was staring straight ahead. Ma'am, you should get back inside, he said. It's not safe out here. That's when the old woman's head fell clean off. Doug screamed bloody murder. Cullen finally came to a decision. He was going to get up from under this bed and attack the creatures while his wife saved their baby. When he became a father, he had accepted that he would have to make sacrifices for his family, but he never imagined anything like this. He watched as both creatures walked over to the closet. It was now or never. He pulled himself from under the bed quickly and stood at the bedroom door. Hey! he screamed. The monsters turned around to face him, and when they did, Cullen lost his breath. Neither of them were the long, sinewy horrors that had walked into his house. One had the face of an Asian boy, little Donnie Tran from down the street, and the other, Miss Summers. They still had long arms and legs, though, and were still bald. It was as if they were in the middle of transforming, or whatever it was they did. Come and get me, he screamed at them. Get the baby, Vanessa. He hoped these things didn't understand what he was talking about, or that they weren't smart enough to realize that he was creating a diversion. Suddenly, the creatures were at the door in quick, jittery motions, like dogs going from still to running. The pitter-patter sounds they made on the floor as they chased Cullen out of the room were horrifying. Cullen ran into the kitchen and grabbed a knife. Then he saw Owen still sitting at the table, blank-faced. Owen, wake the hell up! The monsters were right behind Colin. He slashed at them with a knife, cutting one of their arms. It shrieked as Colin ran around the table. The other monster was blocking his way back to the hallway, though. Without thinking, he dove under the table and immediately regretted it. One of the monsters jumped on the table while the other started pulling chairs away. Colin jumped from under the table and started running for the hallway when something heavy landed on his back. He screamed, but not from pain. He screamed for his wife and their baby to get out. Curtis heard Doug scream like a girl and turned back. Doug was standing in front of one of the houses, looking at something with wide eyes. He ran up to Doug and saw what his friend saw. 
a headless old woman in a rocking chair. Curtis felt a wrenching in his stomach and was afraid he was going to throw up again, but he held it back. He'd thrown up enough. As tough as he liked to think he was, he just wasn't used to seeing dead bodies, and deep down, he hoped he'd never would grow accustomed to it. Why are they doing this? Doug asked quietly. It's got to be the orb, Curtis answered. I just know it is. But why are they mutilating these people? Curtis didn't know. He remembered seeing the boy in the kitchen a few minutes ago. His face had been completely ripped to shreds, and his chest had been torn open with furious slashes. Further search of the house found the bodies of the boy's parents in their bedroom, also torn to ribbons. There hadn't been much blood on the bed where they lay. Why were these creatures doing this? The one they had encountered in Birch Plaza hadn't done anything like this to those two shoe store employees. It had to be the orb. Before they left, Owen had been doing something to it in the kitchen. Whatever he was doing, it had been affecting the bloodsuckers somehow, driving them crazy, maybe. Curtis thought of high-frequency sounds and how they affected dogs. Maybe the orb was sending out some kind of unbearable noise that only the monsters could hear, and they were lashing out at whomever they came across. Dude, we have to get back to the house, Curtis said. The baby. He said no more, and they were off, up the hill. Cullen was being dragged down the hall by one of the creatures. The other followed them. It was the one disguised as Miss Summers. Her old, wrinkled face smiled down on him. Vanessa, run! Cullen screamed, hoping that his wife had taken their baby and escaped. Since he was being dragged backward down the hall, he had to crane his neck to see behind him. Sidney's bedroom door was still closed. Was Vanessa in there now, or was she still hiding in the closet? Miss Summers walked ahead and stood at Sidney's door. Get the baby, Vanessa, she teased in her old lady voice. The things started to make a noise, and Colin guessed it was laughter. They had understood what he was doing, and they were going to make him pay for trying to fool them. Colin knew it in his heart. Miss Summers tried to turn the knob, but the door wouldn't open. It was locked. Vanessa was in there. Miss Summers knocked on the door lightly. Vanessa, dear, she said. Open up. I want to see that precious angel. The real Miss Summers used to call Sidney precious angel all the time when she would come to visit, or when Vanessa took her over there. What were these things? What had Owen brought into his house? Colin had no doubt that Owen was somehow responsible for these things being here. They didn't attack him in the kitchen. It had something to do with that orb. They wouldn't dare attack the orb wielder. If they got out of this alive, Colin would make Owen leave immediately. He loved him, sure, but he loved his family more. They were his priority. Just thinking of the danger they were in now made him sick. Suddenly, Miss Summers slammed against the door, causing it to break open. Vanessa stood near the window, holding a fussy Sydney in her arms. Vanessa had the window open and was about to climb through when Miss Summers leapt over to her. Vanessa screamed. Cullen punched the boy monster as hard as he could in the chest, causing it to drop him. Before Cullen could get to his feet and run to his wife, long pale fingers wrapped completely around his neck and held him down on his knees. Miss Summers grabbed the baby from Vanessa's arms and threw Vanessa to the floor next to the crib. Cullen held his breath, too scared at that moment to do anything. The monster was holding his baby in front of it, sniffing her. Sidney wasn't crying, only staring at the flesh-colored demon holding her. Please don't hurt my baby, Cullen said. Please don't hurt my baby, it mocked, still staring at Sidney. And then it opened its mouth, preparing to devour little Sidney. 
Vanessa screamed at the top of her lungs, and Colin fought with his captor. Vanessa got to her feet and was about to charge the monster holding her baby, but something green and ropey shot through the window and wrapped around the creature's open mouth. There was a hard yank, and the demon was pulled back to the window. Vanessa ran forward and retrieved her baby. Colin kicked the boy monster's feet from under it. After it fell to the floor, he started pounding its face in. Run, said a familiar voice from outside the window. Colin saw Curtis holding Miss Summers at the window with a garden hose. The creature was snarling and gagging, trying to pry the hose from its open mouth, but Curtis was holding it tight. Colin grabbed Vanessa and they ran from the room just as Doug was running in with something in his hand. There were a few shrieks from the monsters, then large, wet popping sounds. Colin was reminded of water balloons bursting. Then silence. A moment later, Doug came out of the room and was covered with black sludge. He smelled like rotten cabbage. Colin saw that he had a sharp piece of wood in his hand. It too was covered in the sludge. What happened? Vanessa asked Doug. I killed them. It's okay. The hell it is, said a voice from the front door. Everyone turned and saw Curtis standing there, and he looked mad. His arms were wet, but not covered in sludge. How come I got covered in this stuff again and you got nothing? Doug asked. I did, said Curtis. I washed my arms off outside. Curtis immediately walked into the kitchen. The others followed. When they got there, they saw him carefully taking Owen's backpack from his lap. I'm going to fix this, all of this, Curtis said, then left the house. What are you going to do? Doug asked. Curtis turned in the yard and faced the others standing in the doorway. I'm going to do what should have been done a long time ago. He looked at Colin and Vanessa. I'm so sorry about what has happened here. Can I borrow your truck? Colin nodded, gave Curtis the keys, and placed his arm around Vanessa. The baby was surprisingly calm now. Curtis ran over to the truck parked in the driveway. Doug pushed gently past the Matthewses. Wait up, I'm coming with... Before Doug could finish his sentence, Curtis was speeding down the street and out of sight. Owen jerked awake and immediately noticed what was missing. He looked around the dark kitchen and saw some of the chairs lying on the floor. He then saw Colin and Vanessa standing at the front door, looking out. He stood and nearly fell back to his seat. How long had he been sitting here? He stood again and waited to make sure he wouldn't fall, then walked over to the Matthewses. What's going on? Why is it so dark? He asked Colin. Colin looked at him and said nothing. The look on his face was hard, though. Owen looked outside and saw Doug standing in the yard, staring at something in the distance. When Doug turned around, Owen gasped. He was covered in a familiar black sludge. No, they can't be here. They can't. Doug walked back to the house and looked at Owen. The Matthewses parted to let him in. They came and attacked your friends, Doug said, indicating the Matthewses. Curtis and I killed them. When Owen found his voice, he said, Where are they? Sydney's room. Owen ran down the hall and into the baby's room. There was a large, reeking puddle in the middle of the room and another by the window. Owen nearly collapsed. He'd brought those things here by activating the orb somehow. He just knew it. The orb? He ran back to the foyer. Where is it? He knew Doug was fully aware of what he was referring to. He took it. He's returning it to them. No! Enough, Owen! Colin screamed, startling Sydney. Vanessa took her to the kitchen. This is enough. My family almost died tonight. I don't want you in my house anymore. If giving these aliens that orb will end this, then let it be done. I'm tired of this. 
They want to destroy the planet with it, Owen said hopelessly, remembering what the voice had told him. They're already trying to do that, Colin said. What do you think those scepters are for? They're bombs or something. Your friend did the smartest thing by taking the orb to them. Trust your friend, Owen. Owen was out the door before Colin could think to say anything else. Curtis spun the truck in the opposite direction, preparing to flee if he had to. Then he got out and started walking in the direction of the giant that made the earth shake. Silver was right down the street, a few yards away. Curtis roughly grabbed the backpack and strolled along the street with the orb in his hand. If this went badly, he planned to hop in the truck and just drive. Not back to the Matthews house, though. He didn't want to put that poor family in any more danger. He would drive until Silver caught up with him and killed him. He held the orb higher over his head. He couldn't tell if the giant even saw him, so he continued down the street toward the back road where it was standing. He shook the orb and even wrapped it with his knuckles. It was vibrating, probably from whatever Owen had been doing with it, but the glow it had been emitting earlier was nearly gone. Suddenly, Silver took a step forward. It was coming toward Curtis. He held the orb up high again, shaking it. And then something tackled him from behind. The orb slid out of his hands and rolled down the street. The backpack dropped to the ground like it was weighed down with lead. Curtis spun around and saw Owen getting to his feet. He jumped up and took Owen down. The ground shook furiously beneath them as Silver approached. Curtis chanced a quick glance up and saw a giant foot crash down very close by. Owen picked up the orb and the backpack, but it didn't matter to Curtis. Silver was here. Owen was unlikely to escape the giant very easily now that it knew what awaited it. A giant foot crashed down in front of them, causing them to nearly collapse from the force. Owen was looking up at the behemoth that stood before them. Curtis merely stood there, too frightened to run. Owen was the closest to the giant, though, and he was frozen, too. For a moment, there was absolute silence. Curtis's and Owen's shadows stretched before them from their respective vehicles' headlights, and then a loud pop pierced the air. The head of the giant began to open. The two young men continued to watch this, not knowing what was happening. Owen reached into his pocket and pulled something out. Curtis only got a glimpse of it, something small and red. And then Owen threw the thing into the air, toward Silver's head. An explosion lit up the sky. Silver swayed before them like a drunken man, its footsteps shaking the ground and causing the headlights to wobble from side to side. Owen ran past Curtis, the orb resting in his arm like a football. Curtis reached out to grab it, but Owen spun around, causing Curtis to fall to the ground again. While this was going on, Silver was still stumbling around behind them. Owen had thrown one of those little bombs at the giant, Curtis realized, and now he was getting away with the orb. Owen grabbed the backpack Curtis had dropped on the road jumped behind the wheel of the little silver car and sped around Curtis, heading for Silver's dancing frame. Since the road was very narrow, the giant's feet were taking up the whole space Owen needed to get by. He had to time it just right. Silver's left foot went up, and Owen floored the gas pedal. He felt the bottom of Silver's foot scrape the roof of the car as it came back down. The ground shook again. Owen nearly lost control of the steering wheel, but managed to keep the car on the road. He drove carefully through the strategically placed scepters in the ground and was gone from that place. Looking into the rearview mirror, he could see Curtis still standing in front of Colin's truck. Why wasn't he driving back to the safety of the house? Why couldn't he understand that Owen was right and that giving the orb to the invaders would be a mistake? Why couldn't he just trust that Owen knew what he was doing? Owen knew in his heart that he had done the right thing by taking the orb back. 
he was going to figure everything out. The voice had told him so. All he had to do was get home. The answers were at home. He looked over to D and wasn't surprised to see the robot looking back at him. We'll put a stop to this, right? Owen asked. D gave a curt nod.